And welcome back to Tomorrow. My name is Benjamin Higginbotham. And before we get into our interview, I did want to give a shout out to all of the patrons of Tomorrow who have helped to make this specific segment of this episode happen. These are people who have contributed $10 or more. They get access to our Slack channel. We've also got a Tomorrow producers. These are people who have contributed $5 or more, and they're going to get access to international free uh, shipping on our swag store. To find out how you can help crowdfund the shows of Tomorrow and get all those different levels of rewards, head on over to patreon.com slash T-M-R-O. All right, now, in we are joined once again by John Powell of JP Aerospace. Uh, thank you very much, John, for taking time out of your Saturday to join us. I know it's been a bit of a long day. Oh, no problem. Uh, so let's start off with who is JP Aerospace? What are you guys doing? Uh, well, we're a small aerospace company. Um, we consider ourselves a private space program. We just had our 38th anniversary this year as an organization since we incorporated in California. And we just got back last weekend um, from our 186th flight, where we flew a bunch of student payloads. We had 180 PongSat student experiments and six of the Minikube student experiments. Um, and we did that run up to 95,000 feet on a high altitude balloon and had a nice flight. And then two weeks before that, we just flew our new airship, uh, the Ascender 36. And so we've been doing a lot of flying and a lot of building and a lot of work in the shop um, on our, we have a hypersonic wind tunnel and we've been trying to get it to Mach 4 for a year and a half now. We're at Mach 3.8 and can't quite break that, but there's a lot going on. So one of the things that you're doing a little bit differently, and actually we brought this up on a few shows uh, a while ago, is you're actually, you're doing balloons for the most part. So you're not doing giant vertical takeoff, vertical landing rockets or anything else like that. Your first stage is a balloon. Oh yeah, our first, our second, and our third stage is the balloon. We are the completely crazy airship to orbit guys. And we've been working on this project for literally decades now. We're the slowest space program in history, working out each technical problem, each technical problem as we go um, to see if we can pull this off. And what is airship to space? How, how does this, what is the plan? Well. The simple idea, or the simple way to put it, is we take a, um, a lighter-than-air vehicle to 160,000 feet, you know, like balloons are flying to uh, right now, and then we slowly start to accelerate it. So we take the go to 60,000 feet, and then with a plasma propulsion system, slowly start to accelerate, and instead of over six minutes accelerating to orbit, we take up to 10 days to accelerate to orbit. But we started our acceleration and our orbital insertion at 400,000 feet, way above the atmosphere. Essentially, we want to change the whole nature of space travel by taking the rocket completely out of it. But as was brought up in the chat room, I believe this is brought by Vogan, you can't fly a balloon to space. Uh, you know, those gases are going to expand. Uh, so how do you deal with it? There's a certain threshold that you, you just can't go over. How do you deal with that? Well, actually, it's dynamic climb to orbit. Um, think of it as a flying giant flying wing. The, we actually are getting no buoyancy, or it's diminished buoyancy, and we're neutral at around 230,000 feet. And then that's when we actually begin to accelerate the vehicle, slowly climb. We don't even break Mach 1 until we're over 300,000 feet. Where you know, they were taking balloons in the 60s, the uh, Project Shot Put balloons, they were flying them at Mach 10, at three to 400,000 feet. It's kind of our first goal is to replicate that old 60s technology and get our balloons going at Mach 10, or not quite, but almost halfway orbital velocity at three to 400,000 feet. So the question becomes, well, they could do that in the early 60s. Can we push it a little faster today? If with you know, 40, 50 years more advanced technology, can we go to Mach 14 instead of Mach 10? Can we go to Mach 15? How far can you take that technology? And that's the question that we're trying to, to ask at JP Aerospace. I can't tell you if we can actually go Mach 22, but I can tell you it's an important enough question that somebody needs to find out. And that's what we're doing. How fast have you gotten the system to go? Uh, we've been, th uh, with the smaller vehicles, we've been up to Mach 3.5, but that's nothing as part of our bigger system at all. And that's not been driven with our primary engines, that's been driven with solids. Um, right now, 
You know, our biggest airship we built was a little bigger than a 747, and we actually, that was a custom build we did for the Air Force about 12 years ago when we built a whole series of these big B-shaped airships for them. Our latest series, we built a 26-foot airship that we flew last year a couple of times, and then we're building a 30, we finished the 36-foot, the Ascender 36, and we flew that um, about two months ago now. And that, that one looks like this. Huh. Got props, have to have props. <laughs> And that was the, yeah. those were the blue balloons that we showed earlier, right? The, the yeah. giant blue, I think dutta has got them coming up here. Here's one on the ground, right? You flew, you know, yes. we saw pictures of this flying. This is what you flew just a, you said a couple weeks ago? Yeah, well that one's um, about a couple of months ago. We just flew um, literally last weekend, but one of our conventional balloons that we fly our payloads on. And this one, even though it's smaller than the ones we built in the past, it's with all the new technology in it, the internal structure, the internal balloon lifting cells, the command and control system is completely different um, on these new smaller vehicles. And it's cheaper to test these on small vehicles than the really big vehicle. So one of the questions from the chat room, or more of a comment says, uh, this is from Space Cookie 84 says, that's cool. So basically you're waiting until most of the atmosphere is below you before you're putting the pedal to the metal. And you're not really putting the pedal to the metal. You're more kind of just very slowly continuing. You're just never letting go, right? You've got a very slow moving vehicle, but you never let off the accelerator. Exactly. So based on that, go ahead. The 50s, or excuse me, in the late 50s, early 60s, were just mylar balls. And they got these very thin mylar balls um, to go to Mach 10, and they were they didn't quite get all the way around the Earth. They didn't orbit because they're only 400,000 feet at only Mach 10, but they were getting literally uh, circling the Earth, and not just ballistically. Um, so, again, ours are a little sturdier and have their own propulsion rather than just be pushed by solids. So one of the things Space Kyle mentions, um, you know, Mach speed is uh, relative to atmospheric pressure. More specifically, the, the, it's the speed of sound, which, is, um, which changes through atmospheric pressure and density. Uh, so oh, yeah. you're saying like Mach 10, is, is that Mach 10 at sea level or at that altitude? At, at sea level, Mach 10. Okay. As just a, a number to explain. Sure. Because well, well, the Mach number changes up there. So uh, using just kind of an absolute, will you a be able to hit, are you targeting like the 17,500 mile per hour range? That's kind of generally considered, you know, orbital velocity. That's the number you're trying to reach. But the question at this point is, can you reach that number with balloons? You, you know you can push them forward. It's, it's, it's just, can you make 17,500 miles an hour? Yes, that's the question. And one of the big parts of it that we're doing in the lab is we're doing active drag reduction um, again, this is a lot of stuff that was in the lab in the 60s and 70s, and you can search and there's literally hundreds of IAAA papers on it, on electrically reducing drag by emitting plasma in front of the field, breaking up the shock wave at hypersonic speeds. And right now, we've, we really need to be getting to Mach 4 for that testing to really be valid, and we're doing a lot of our uh, wind tunnel testing in the shop here, and we just got our wind tunnel, say we're at Mach 3.8, um, starting to do that kind of research because even at 300,000 feet and 400,000 feet, you know, you can get up close to where Alan Shepard went, there's still a lot of drag up there. And so we need to, um, to reduce the drag by about 40% to kind of close the loop to make that work. And in the 60s, they were getting 80 and 90% drag reductions on those systems. But those were in the lab, mm -hmm. and we want to take those lab experiments and put it in the real world. And that's a whole different can of worms. So what does it take to take those lab experiments and move them into the real world? Is it a funding issue, a time issue, a building issue? What, 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 what do you need to get from A to B? Well, next fall's mission. <laughs> we fly about five missions every year. Um, and we're all independently funded. We're crowdfunded. We do small contracts. We do a lot of TV commercials. We did Margarita in Space for National Margarita Day for Jose Cuevo. We did The Chair in Space. Oh, I remember yeah. that. The oh. Chair in Space, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh huh. <laughs> and that's actually a full size chair. That's really cool. What you don't see above the chair 
is the big balloon platform, these carbon booms coming down with IMAX cameras all around, you know, filming all that. Um, and even though we're just nickel and dime, just barely making it, we've never missed a mission or a build a vehicle, uh, never had a problem due to lack of funding. So you mentioned crowdfunding is one of the things. Uh, is that an active campaign like on Kickstarter, Patreon, something like that, or is it just kind of... Uh... Oh, we don't have one going on now. We've done two successful Kickstarters, and we're ramping up for our third. We'll probably be starting that in about four months, because um, it takes a lot to put one of those together. And that's mainly to fund... These are, are PONSATs, and we're actually the largest student payload program in the world. We've flown more student payloads by an order of magnitude than all the rest of the world's space programs combined. We've now flown, with this last mission last weekend, just over 18,000 student experiments. Oh, wow. From about, it's about 75 to 80,000 students have participated. And on this last vehicle, in fact, the one in the picture there, um, there was about 480 student experiments, and some are real simple, you know, like uh, little marshmallows that puff up in vacuum or plant seeds, and some of them had GPSs and cameras. We had one that had a GPS, a camera, and he was taking pictures um, every 10 seconds and then uh, altitude stamping each of the pictures as he went. And then it also had cubes, you know, like CubeSats. We have a smaller version called the Mini Cube, and this is one from Eastern Florida State University, and it flew on the last mission. This is a double stack cube, because there's a cube here and a cube there. And it's got a whole range of sensors and doing their experiments. And we fly a lot of these. The PONSATs were always free. In fact, most of the money doesn't go into the airship orbit program. Most of the money from the TV commercials pays for flying ping pong balls. Hmm. Um, but the universities pay for um, flying the cubes, and that also helps pay for the CubeSats. And then on each of these missions, even though they have all these education payloads on, there's five or six uh, airship to orbit experiments. So anything that goes on an airship before it flies on the airship will have flown to the edge of space a dozen times on one of the balloon vehicles, just sh testing it and doing shakedown. So so it's a big, giant, crazy program with these big, giant, crazy ideas. But literally every couple of months, we're doing the flights, flying the missions, crossing one more impossible thing off the list. So it sounds like you're using the balloon missions and the Pong sats and the, and the, uh, the very small CubeSat missions as a way to test out the technology for your airship to orbit uh, stuff. Then once you get oh, airship... Exactly. Then once you get airship to orbit kind of working and moving faster and actually making it into orbital speeds, uh, what's kind of the game plan there? Is, is that a, is something that helps reduce the cost of objects to orbit? I mean, what, what does the advantage of airship to orbit get me? Oh, we want to change the whole nature of space travel. Right now, it's like, to use the shuttle as an example, except for right near the end, if you had an engine out, it's called, they call it LOC or loss of crew event. There are so many things that are loss of crew event. With the airship to orbit, say you're right in the middle of the final orbital insertion burn, um, and your engine conks out, or anywhere on there. Well, you go have a meeting about it. It's not like you have to make everything right and save the crew in the next four seconds for everybody's dead. You have a meeting about it, you talk to the people on the ground, you have a big conference call, wait a couple hours, you go work in the back, tear down the engine, see if you can fix it. And if you can't fix it, you float back down. And the idea is that what if you took off in your 747 and everyone in the control tower, every time it took off, everyone jumped up and cheered, oh, thank God, everybody made it. You wouldn't want to fly on 747s. But that's what happens every time we fly astronauts to space. The moment the rocket engine shuts down, everybody jumps up and cheers and cries because they didn't kill everybody. Um, we want to change that. And also, it's a completely reusable system. Right now, transatlantic travel is five cents per ton mile by container ships, and a modern container ship is an amazingly sophisticated vehicle. Um, not quite as sophisticated as a space shuttle, but pretty complex in its own right. We want to bring not 
the thousand dollar a pound, the mythical thousand dollar a pound from the ten thousand dollar a pound. We want to bring it down to dollars per ton mile, just like cargo is. How large do you need to make the airship to bring it to make that vision a reality? Oh, these are huge vehicles. And remember, they're also inflatable vehicles, so size, you know, it's like we built one vehicle that was a little bigger than, bigger than a 747, but only weighed 630 pounds, and that's the total vehicle and engine weight. We're talking about a vehicle, our primary test vehicle that we're eventually going to build is 6,000 feet long. You know, it's literally over a mile long airship. So it's a giant airship. Uh, you can put humans on it. You can put cargo on it. Once you figure yep. out the velocity part of it, right? So you're still testing. Mm -hmm. You're not quite there yet, but working towards it. Uh, you, you mentioned one of the factors is safety. And, and certainly um, chemical engines are, and even solids, are scary, right? I mean, it's a controlled explosion, which, oh, yeah. which you, you don't really have. But you are on a giant balloon. And that balloon can, uh, and this is a bit of a harsh term, but it could pop. I mean, it could, you could lose the structure of the balloon, could you not? Would that not be a, a immediate Actually, no. catastrophic? No, the, it's like our current airships. It looks like it's one big vehicle. If you did a cutaway, it's actually a series of smaller balloons all up and down those arms. And we can lose up to three balloons in flight and not even abort the mission. We lose the fourth balloon in flight and then we do have to not catastrophically fall, but abort the mission and, fall, and fly down and land. So you have a point where even if you start losing structure, you can go, okay, well, we've lost too much structure. We abort at this point, and you just you come back, and that's that. Yeah. that. Yeah. Assuming you don't fact, continue to lose structure yeah. on your way back down. Oh, yeah. Well, if the whole thing breaks up and it falls apart and explodes, um, then everybody gets out. Um, but so many things would have to happen for that. Like on the, the big one that we built for the Air Force, the 175-foot, on the top was six 14-inch diameter vents for venting the helium. At 100,000 feet, those vents have to be open for about 45 minutes, all six of them, before you can detect descent. Oh, wow. So say you had a meteor hit you and left a big hole. Well, the real trick isn't that you're calling falling to your doom. The real trick is detecting that that event has happened because the pressures are near vacuum. The flow rate across there is so low. If you have the meteor storm and you had six of them, well, you know, in 45 minutes, you're going to be starting down. Um, and what you do at the time, if you detect that, you pump the remaining helium from those cells into the adjacent cells. And you definitely abort the mission if you have a whole bunch of holes from meteors in you. It's an interesting concept, right? Because you don't have the chemical engine reaction, so you don't have, you don't, you're not worried about that. It sounds like you have some redundancy in structure. I mean, nothing's foolproof, but you, you've got a good chunk oh, yeah. of redundancy in structure. Um, so then it's just a, a matter of, uh, and how are you re-entering, right? Because one, one of the problems is you're going 17,500 miles an hour. You're going to slam into atmosphere, and you're going to want to burn up. Do you just... Well, we I mean, do our deceleration up high instead of down low. Um, Re-entry temperature is really based on wing loading or surface area to mass. Surface area to mass determines, you know, your temperature load and your heat load. Um, the 6,000 foot vehicle, the max re-entry temperature is right around 71 degrees. So, in fact, the drag, even in orbit, the drag is so high you have to keep the engines on. You're truly not in a free orbit. You um, literally, you're flying up there, you get to orbit, you have to release your payload or deploy the payload. And then to re-entry, you're not doing a re-entry burn. You're literally throttling down. And the drag pulls you back down. So let's go back to some questions from the uh, chat room. Uh, one of them comes from uh, Sane Alex, uh, which asks about those engines. Uh, are they going to be solar-powered plasma? Or basically, what, what's your fuel for that? They're actually hybrid engines. They're not in the... Well, only partially in the sense of the, the chemical engine, liquid oxygen, and a solid fuel. They're hybrid in the sense of half plasma engine, half chemical engine. And uh, in a sense, you have a, in a chemical engine, the combustion chamber is where the fire is, where the plasma is. We're actually using that plasma from a chemical reaction 
to accelerate and then accelerating that magnetically like a traditional plasma engine. So it's half chemical engine, half plasma engine. People haven't looked at this kind of engine before because you could think of it as the world's worst ion engine. You know, a traditional ion engine, they have a thing called ISP, which is kind of a function of performance. You know, they're getting 60,000, 70,000 ISP. Just amazing on these quad-staged ion engines. But they can barely lift a piece of paper up off the ground. So they're basically for orbital things. And then you have your chemical engines that have ISPs in the 350 range, or the shuttle, which was the best ever in the 400 range. But they burn all their fuel in moments. And you can't really throttle them down. You, well, you can, but you throttle them down and your ISP tanks. You can't really run a shuttle engine you know, just barely on slow. So what this engine is, is a small chemical engine. And then the chemical engine creates the ions or the plasma. And in ion engines, that's actually quite a bit of the power, electrical power requirement is in that creation of the ions. We actually do away with that power requirement by using the chemical engine to do that. And then on the back side, it's what's referred to as either a mixed ion gas or non-mixed equilibrium ion gas or dirty ion engine then as a plasma engine to accelerate that plasma. The reason it's a terrible engine, it's either um, the world's worst chemical engine because it can't even lift itself off the ground. Or it's the world's worst ion engine because instead of 60,000 ISP, it only has 1,000 ISP. You'd only need this if, say, you were, had a steamship going across the Atlantic and you need an engine that would chuck along for nine days and give you a reasonable amount of thrust. Well, that's what we have. We have the airship lifting that until we get really high and start dynamically climbing. So the, it's an engine that has no use on the planet except for our purposes. And we actually have a pretty vigorous engine program. You know, we've done about 119 firings so far, just all very small scale. And we've done four flights. We're actually, our, by our test stand for our engines are at 100,000 feet because we do fire them off at, on platforms um, from our high racks. We have pong sats below, rocket engines firing off the top. And that's actually coming along really well and we're starting to scale up our engines. And we um, now cannot fire the engines in our parking lot anymore because the last one set off some car alarms a few blocks away, made lots of noise. Um, we just recently now have our own facility up in northern Nevada. The last couple of launches we did was from, called the Area, Area 42, because it's 42 acres, or the JP Space Advanced Research Facility, which is a fancy way of saying big plot of land with a cargo container on it. And that's where the, the next round, probably in January, of the engine firing tests will be taking place. So, dumb question on your chemical rockets. You know, what, one of the disadvantages of a traditional rocket is it's the chemical reaction is a controlled explosion. It's a very large, yes. very powerful controlled explosion. And if you lose even a little bit of that control, it's a very bad day. Uh, yeah. But if you're using chemical rockets on your vehicle, how is that any different? Oh, one thing, it's a lot smaller. And we're burning at a much lower rate than you would. It's more akin to a jet engine firing than it is to a rocket engine firing. But that risk is there. You do, you don't, it doesn't completely vanish. And then, so you're, you're using these engines. Uh, the other disadvantage of a chemical engine is you're going to expend your fuel at some point. Uh, you're 10 days to it's, orbit, so are you bringing like huge vats of fuel or do you only have, need a little bit? Like, how, how does your fuel work for a 10, 10 the fuel, plus day Actually, the chemical part of the engine is also a hybrid, where the fuel is a solid and the oxidizer is a liquid. So it's really cartridge-based. And these engines are long. The engine is about 300 feet long. It's more akin to a linear accelerator um, that you keep a flame going inside um, than a rocket engine. And then it's also cartridge-based. And, and so right now the rocket, you have to literally open up the engine and replace all the cartridges between flights. Uh, you mentioned your oxidizer. What, what are you using for your oxidizer? Is it liquid oxygen, something else? Well, for what we're doing right now, we're doing nitrous and acrylic, and we're moving to nitrous in the spring and uh, paraffin, you know, enhanced paraffin. 
you know, paraffin with magnesium particles in it. We don't see that being combination as being the final one. There's a lot of candidates for it. Um, but like I say, we're still, you know, right hip deep in the development process. I'm thinking it's probably going to be a LOX, paraffin, and magnesium combination. But that's, uh, we won't really know for a couple more years. Uh, this question comes from Green Gym 2, which is, uh, you know, we talked about this uh, 10 days to orbit. Traditional rockets have launch wind windows measured in seconds or uh, minutes uh, because they're trying to, you know, make this particular orbit and you have to pass by it at a certain time. Uh, what does a 10 day orbit launch have as a launch window? Is it the same kind of you need to get oh, moving you have or? Huge, huge adjustable launch window because you can accelerate, decelerate. We want to be in kind of the middle window. So if we need to drop down to 12 day insertion, we can make that change in flight or accelerate up to an eight day exertion, exertion, excuse me, insertion if we need to. So we don't have those real tight, narrow, narrow windows like a traditional rocket would. And how far does this scale? We're about to see the Gozar launch in you know, an hour from now or so. Would you be able to take that satellite eventually up to its intended orbit? Well, the, there's the eventual vehicle. Our eventual dream vehicle is the 6,000 foot vehicle. Now, our initial vehicle demonstrator for um, actually reaching orbit is only 1,800 feet, you know, baby 1,800 foot long vehicle. Um, and that one will only carry a couple hundred pounds to orbit. Our eventual goal with a 6,000 foot vehicle that we're kind of scaling everything around is 60,000 uh, pounds to orbit to LEO. Uh, Destructor 1701. Space stations intact to orbit. Uh, Destructor 1701 asks At the end of the day, for your 6,000 foot vehicle, fully laden, how long would it take to get, for example, uh, to the International Space Station type orbit? Because assuming you could go, theoretically, assuming you have enough power, you could go anywhere you want. Well, ideally, this vehicle will just take payload to LEO, to minimum LEO orbits. And uh, OTV you know, orbital transfer vehicle um, is really the ideal vehicle for taking it up to the station. You wouldn't want to drag this big airship and all that infrastructure up from LEO to a station altitude. So we're not really, really shooting for that. We're just kind of giant bulk cargo to LEO. But you could take bulk cargo that then from LEO launches itself up to the International Space Station. That's exactly right? it. That's exactly it. So would someone else develop those vehicles? You're basically saying, hey, look, we've got this big, huge thing. And then you go to, say, Sierra Nevada, for example, and say, hey, we'll get you really high up and going at, at really good velocity if you can make it the rest of the way there. Oh, exactly. We'd love to develop that top half vehicle. But doing that on top of doing all of this, um, I think it would be a bit too much. It's almost like, what if we don't pull this off? Worse, say we only get back to what they did in 1962, and we got to Mach 10 at 400,000 feet. That makes an awesome air launch vehicle to fire a rocket on top of. What if we do a little better and we get to Mach 15 at 500,000 feet? Um, suddenly a Falcon 1 fired from there is like a Falcon Heavy. And that's if we don't make it. That's the, hard. Other, the other and thing we can look at is once you're at those speeds and those payloads, um, mm -hmm. you could use it simply as a refueling architecture for traditional rockets. So we want to go to Mars, yes. for example. You know, it's, we need to bring fuel depots up to space. What is a cheap, easy way to just bring giant fuel tanks up there where we can refuel? Uh, this might be an interesting way to do that. It gets you a good chunk of the way there, and then maybe a couple solids on the sides brings it the rest of the way to where it needs to be. Yeah. Because, you know, air launch is getting more and more popular, um, where it's kind of, it comes and goes, you know, at Virgin Galactic, and um, I don't know why I don't remember their name right now, with a giant double 747. Strata launch. Strata launch, yes. And they're talking about flying from about Mach 0.8 from 50,000 feet for their air launch. They're great people, but that's wimpy air launch. Air launch should be 500,000 feet at Mach 17. That's air launch. 
Uh, Destructor1701 also asks, what sort of materials challenges do the 1,806,000 uh, uh, foot vehicles present in terms of stresses? The stress, the conventional stresses that you look in spacecraft design are well handled with those materials. There's actually some exotic stresses that, that are the real challenges. Um, because this is a flexible membrane surface, you get this phenomenon called hypersonic flutter. And usually in hyper, like X-15 and hypersonic craft, you have flutter issues on, on the rudder and on the horizontal stabilizers. We actually have the problem of hypersonic flutter on across the surface of the vehicle. And that's one of the really extreme design challenges that we're trying to model um, in our hypersonic wind tunnel to start to get a handle on. Because if you don't have a handle on it, there's no known material and you can make your thing out of concrete encased in steel encased in titanium, but if you have hypersonic flutter, it's not enough. So it's really, you can't handle it, you can't solve it through a materials solution, unfortunately. You have to solve it through a management of the load issues. I mean, the solution has to lie there. All right, just a couple more questions. Uh, this one comes from Citizen12708, uh, which is, uh, why don't you put these firings on YouTube? Uh, the rocket engine firings, I think he was referring to. I have about 20 of them up there. We they, do. <laughs> they want more. They want more. They want them all live. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone wants everything. I'm still, I haven't got the videos from the last airship up there yet. I have to get these. Whenever we do the pong saps, all the kids get a documentary of their mission so they can see their ping pong balls. And, and so we're in heap deep of making that. But I think I have like a dozen firings on YouTube. Again, these are all very small. They're not very big. These are little engines. Um, and we've just scaled them up to be too scary to be standing next to when they fire, which is why we have to move out to the desert to, to do them. So those videos will be more fun because <laughs> more, more fire, more flame. <laughs> Hopefully controlled, hopefully controlled the whole time. Hopefully controlled. Uh, Jim Burr asks, what's, speaking of those uh, launchers, uh, what's the cost per small sat launch? For yeah, what let's we're say, doing now? Let's say a citizen yeah, wants to bring up a Pong sat or, uh, yeah, uh, one oh. of the small cube sats or something like that. Sats are completely free. We don't charge anything and we do thousands every year. These guys, this is our double cube. There is two, you can buy them in pairs. And then when you buy them in pairs, they're a little cheaper. But they're $340, and you get the cube and the flight for the $340. Now, we also just, in fact, we announced it today. We've never had this before. Our new cube is called the Arduino cube. And it's elongated, so you can put an Arduino board in there. Hmm. And the Arduino boards, or Arduino cubes, are going to be $440. And that includes the cube and the flight of the cube. Right. And we just flew our Arduino cube on this last mission. Uh, last question before we go into the, we've got a little rapid fire thing we're going to do. And this comes from Space okay. Pi, uh, and this is uh, during the last interview, which I think was about six years ago or so, uh, you mentioned a high altitude propeller design. Are you still working with propellers at all? We did that. We pulled it off. We made the world's only tested high altitude propeller. Then afterwards, the Helios people did that. Um, ours performs a little bit better, but they spent over a billion on it. And we spent about 6000 on it, huh. and that's part of the project we did for the Air Force. And those drive all our, we set the world altitude record for airships only two years ago. Oh, three, four years ago, time flies, um, with our tandem airship. And those are six meter, excuse me, six foot blades. And we flew it to 95,000 feet, flew it around. And those propellers are, were on that vehicle, and they're on uh, our airships that we're flying now. Uh, I'm just going to mirror something that Destructor1701 said, which is, you're awesome. I love how far outside of the box you're thinking. Uh, and, oh, thank you. Uh, it, it's really cool to see new innovative ways. Uh, the fact that you're, you're I would say, normally we say bending metal, but you're not really bending metal. You're more like stitching balloons? I don't know what phrase to use yeah, there, but... taping a lot of things together. A there lot of you go. Up. You're making <laughs> hardware. You're actually flying things. And, uh, you know, a lot of the traditional aerospace people might go, well, that's not space. Well, it's not space yet, right? So uh, once yeah. you get those velocities up, yeah. Yeah. The really thing is it used to be space. When the X-15 program was going on, 
this huge titanic argument that would get really heated between scientists whether space began at 70,000 feet or 100,000 feet. By the time the end of the X-15 program, the 100,000 foot guys won, absolutely. And they finally got support of the pilots when they started flying above them. Huh. Um, but then it got declared when they got in that fight with NASA and the Air Force that it began at 50 miles. So the X-15 guys didn't count. That's more of a political thing than a science thing. But officially, it's near space. Doesn't matter. You're, you're working on stuff. You're working on matter. stuff to go faster and faster, and you continue to yeah. iterate on the design. And it's very cool that you're actually building things and making stuff happen. And I'm, I'm excited to see uh, uh, what comes of that. We were all excited with the uh, 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 balloon, uh, castle, balloon castles, I think is what we, it was referred to. And we thought it was just really cool. All right. Um, these are a few questions that we ask all of our guests now. Uh, in the, you okay. can have really short answers. Uh, this is just, uh, there are no right or wrong answers. All right. Uh, so the first question is Moon or Mars first? Venus. Uh, oh, good answer. Uh, liquid or solid propellant? Uh, hybrid chemical electric propellant. <laughs> uh, what should the name of the first vehicle going to Mars be? Anything but calling it Mars or one of the variations are like Aries or sure just something besides calling the Mars mission Mars when do you think humans will first land on Mars oh I'd say we're solid 20 out 20 I years. think we're going back to the moon first interesting so that would be first. my bet if I had to put a dollar down I would love it to happen sooner but I think we're 20 years out. I think we're going to get close, and then we're going to zoom over to the moon. That ties to my next question quite well. When do you think humans will set foot on the moon again? Oh, I said within 10 years. Interesting. Maybe and, within eight years. And why space? Because I want to go. All right, great answers. Uh, John, where can pe uh, people find more information about you and JP Aerospace if they want to keep up to date oh, with you? I Try to post uh, pictures on our Facebook site every day. Um, I get to the, our blog, and you can search for us, JP Aerospace, on Facebook. We also have a Twitter account that we post about every other day. The blog, we post at jpaerospace.com, right across the top. Click on the blog. I get to that about once a week. <laughs>